Hey there, folks. Welcome to the final episode of the DC Crisis on Infinite Films, where we talked about all the best and the worst of DC films. Well, a, a, a good bit of both. You might be asking, well, where's my Dark Knight? Or, you never even talked about the original Superman films. And you're right, but we can't spend a whole six months on one theme. Tried it, had fun, but it didn't get the views to support it. I mean, just check out the Ghibli movies. Um, but hey, don't fret. Batman is not off the table. If you want to see us cover other DC characters, Marvel characters, the ones from Image Comics, or even video game adaptations, uh, then I have one favor to ask of you. Go to patreon.com slash evacstation. For less than the cost of paying uh, Shazam for your for saving your liquor store, you can go support our show. Uh, and uh, you can pay us to do more podcasts like these, but for full time instead of the whole, you know, whenever we have time model. Um... It'll be the best way to, for you to get the, uh, your Batman-centric episodes or, you know, something else entirely that you're asking for. Uh, we love these movies and we love talking about them and we want to keep doing this as long as we can. Because we love entertaining you and these are just fun conversations to have. Again, that's patreon.com slash evacstation. That's E-V-A-C-S-T-A-T-I-O-N. And uh, I think you're going to like this one. The imagination of Spielberg, the suspense of Hitchcock, the nostalgia of Abrams, the magic of Zemeckis, the brutality of Aronofsky, and the wonder of Miyazaki. We are the After Credits cast, and this is Shazam! Shazam! <laughs> Spoiler warning, this is a fun movie. <laughs> Uh, I am Aaron J. Wazeska, and with me today I've got Ryan Metters. Ryan, it's been a hot minute since I've heard from you. It has been a hot minute, sir. I am glad to be back. And this was a, this is a fun one to come back to. I'm not going to lie, Ryan. We did all these D DC movies, and I thought to myself, man, it's going to be hard to top Wonder Woman or Aquaman. They're both pretty solid p bits of work there. This is a contender. I did not expect really? that going into this. <laughs> Oh, I feel like this is going to be a fun conversation. Oh, boy. Right. <laughs> oh, boy. Okay. Um, before we get too deep into this, let me remind everybody, you can go to patreon.com to support us, uh, patreon.com slash evacstation. There's also uh, finding us on YouTube, Peepa, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, and Podcast Addict. If you want to reach out to us as well, there's also the various social media platforms, uh, Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, and, of course, you can email us directly. Uh, tell us your favorite DC movies, least favorite DC movies, or anything in general. You know, how the weather is where you're at. Uh, Ryan, where can they email us at? They can email us at Shazam, is that really your fucking name at gmail. I'm sorry. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, they can email us at evacstation at gmail.com. Say it! Say my name! <laughs> Say it! Like the fuck? Yeah. Well, as always, Ryan, we uh, have a quick segment we always like to hit up, which is the Whatcha Watchin' segment, where we talk about what we've been watching the past week, or for us, I guess, last two weeks, since we took a little mini vacation between recording sessions. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Um, so, uh, partially because of that break um, and birthdays that ensued, one of the birthday, or well, the birthday present that I got, the big one, um, is my Whatcha Watchin'. I have been watching arterial blood spew from the throats of my enemies as I fucking stealth assassinated them all throughout the latest fucking masterpiece from software. And Ooh. that is Sekiro. Sekiro. Okay, okay. Shadows okay. die twice. Okay, I, I've been Damn. I've been sitting on the wings for this one. Tell me, is it worth the money? It is 100% worth the money. No, no lie. This is, okay, 
this is this is a game where it's fucking hard. Like it's from software, of course it's fucking hard. But it actually feels like like once you get good at it, it feels like you're fucking good. Like it it the the system and story and setting all on all in of itself is really fucking immersive. The combat is gorgeous. It's a lot of it's it's both simplified and more complex at the same time, but it feels more intuitive. It's a lot of attack and defense, but you kind of interchange. Like it feels like a real crossing of blades. Like you you swing and then you have to look for tells when they're swinging at you so that you can block. And if you block, time it just perfectly, you can get some deflect and enemies posture comes into play and if you fuck up their posture high enough then you can just death blow them it's goofy it's so much fun it's so hard but it it really captures the feeling of being a ninja in feudal japan with spooky demons and shit it's hmm. really good i was like I, i'm looking to get in that soon um it is on my back burner right now though because one I, I, it's it's 60 bucks i'm a cheapskate uh, but two more. You're, you're buying a house. You're not a fucking cheapskate. <laughs> okay, well I'm saving. I'm, I'm saving for a house. That's a good. That's a good enough answer there. Uh, but no, the other reason oh, is be- the other reason though is because uh, I recently picked up Bloodborne. I won't talk about it now, be- oh. but I will talk about it soon because uh, oh, yeah. Hit me up. Oh God, it's so good. T- took took me a hot minute to get back into it, but I picked it back up, and I will get more to that once I have more to talk about. But uh, let's just say I finally got over the hurdle I was at last time, and now I'm running with it. So I will t- I will tell you, Bloodborne is the first From Software game that I actually finished. Like I've played and beaten all of the bosses in that game, and it's it's good. Are you, inc- are you including cool. DLC on that too, or are you just talking base, uh, base game? No, no, I've beaten the DLC. Okay, it's, okay. It's like. Spooky good. One of my best friends, like when we when we get together, we drink, we get high, and we play Bloodborne, and we pass off to each other when we die. It's just bonkers. It's just so much fun. I, I'm so <laughs> glad you're playing it. I'm so glad. All right, you'll have to tell me more about it later. Yep, in- indeed, indeed. Uh, for my what you watching though, I wanted to keep it topical. So Ryan, after I think you recommended this once before. Um, I took the plunge into it, uh, actually before we took our little break, but we really got hardcore into it once the break started. We are now on season three of Supergirl. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, remind me what's happening. Spoiler alert! Remind yep. me what's happening story-wise so I can know exactly where you are. So spoilers for anyone who has not caught up with the third or current season. I'm behind, so I feel like I'm safe spoiling people, honestly. Uh, so Supergirl, uh, season three, that is the one with the world ending, world killers, rain, the skull, Kryptonians. Oh shit, you are, I think you're where I left off because like, I, I think I left off in the middle of this. I, I think I left off like right at the season break of season three when she has her first like real fight with rain. And that's fair, because this season is a little bit dark and bleak. Not bad, but, like, it kind of reminds me of how season three of Flash went, where I just kind of, <laughs> at the end of it, it left a bad taste in my mouth. I'm like, I love the Flash, but this season just tasted really sour, and I didn't like it. And I get- like, I... I'm not. I'm not against like dark seasons. Like I, I, I tend to eat that shit up. And and where it left off in that season break, I actually really, really liked it. I just I haven't been watching as much TV as I used to, and I've completely fallen behind on all of my CW shows. So that's just where I happen to leave off. Of that's, that fair. Show. that's fair. That's fair. Um, we actually even watched the crossover episode, the Crisis on uh, on World X uh, episodes. Oh, where they're all uh, Nazis? Yeah, that yep. was pretty good. That was pretty fun. And uh, I think I got her excited now to actually watch The Flash because we've now seen three crossovers that include his character. And she's like, okay, I kind of want to see what's going on with this. He's so. really he's really good. Yo, The Flash is, is like legit the best CW show they've got. So yeah, you don't, you don't if pre- she's going to watch any of them. You don't, you don't have to preach she, to me, man. I, I'm all on board with that shit. <laughs> if she's going to watch any of them, she should pick up The Flash. That shit's real. I'm mad that I haven't seen the latest up, the latest season because him, like, like that storyline is really, really good. I just haven't had the time. 
See, now I'm purposely not watching the newest one because I'm like, well, I'm going to watch it soon anyway when we when we rewatch everything for her, so I'm just going to wait till then. So. That's fair. That's very fair. But hey, watching things with your girlfriend, it's it's a thing that I'm getting used to, right? <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, but yeah, no, it's been really fun. Um, I It's one of the few shows where I've liked every single character so far, like or at least of the main cast. Like, in most shows, I feel like there's a character on there somewhere that I just can't get behind or, like, annoys me. But I've actually been fun with every character so far. Like, it's just really refreshing that everyone has something about them that is entertaining, fun, or likable. So That's really cool, man. Okay, okay, so so we, we actually have to get to the movie. But later on, you and I are going to talk more about Supergirl. Because I, like, that's a well-done show. It's just a well-done show. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and Ryan's right. We do have a movie to get to. Uh, as, hopeful, as a hopeful end to our Crisis of Infinite films, we come to Shazam! Released in 2019 and directed by David F. Sandberg and written by both uh, Henry Gaiden and Darren Lemk. Lemke. Lemke. I'm not sure. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Lemke. I'm Lemke? Sure it's Lemke. Okay. Being so new, I only have the opening numbers of... I gotta open the tab here. Uh, worldwide is 162,181,000. Uh, for, yeah. for domestic, that's 59,888,000. Uh, uh, um, it's not doing super hot first weekend, but I do feel like a lot of that might be the, um, just fatigue of DC films. I think Aquaman started off with a interesting opening weekend, but blew up really quick right afterwards. So I think we might see some pops in the following weeks, because there's been a lot of positive buzz, a lot of good people, a lot of people saying good things about it, so, uh, I would not you be know surprised. What? It's weird because I honestly, like hand to god i honestly forgot that it came out this weekend <laughs> and, and allegra was like hey have you seen shazam yet and i was like oh fuck i need to watch that like today <laughs> um but i feel like i feel like um at least just for me my personal experience i feel like uh advertisement for the movie kind of dropped off a little bit um, and that's and I think that's I, I feel I feel like they might have been waiting for opening weekend and for like reviews to come in to like really like hit people up and like hey you should come see it now that everybody's saying it's really good and but, like but what's weird yeah. about that though is that um, Fandango had an event where they showed the movie like a week or two early for the, so like VIP members and there was positive buzz all from that I'm surprised they didn't be like oh shit we need to fucking crank this marketing campaign up to high gear now yeah me too it's a little weird. But, but, uh, no, it's a sleeper hit, guys. Uh, definitely check it out if you get a chance, and we'll get to that in more details here in a minute. Um, the cast includes... I can never get this fucking name right. Uh, Digimon Honsu? I'm pretty sure the, the D is silent. So, Jimon <laughs> Honsu. Yeah. Okay. It's like Django. Or, yeah, d or that's, Django. That's, that's, that, is the, that is the reference that I was making. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, Mark Strong. Uh, no longer sporting the green, uh, uh, you know, paint. Uh, Jack the, Dylan. You mean you mean the pink skin? Yes, the pink Mark skin, Trump? green green suit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jack Dylan Grazer, Adam Brody, Grace Fulton, Michelle Bor Borth, uh, Ian Chen, Ross Butler, Faith Herman, Megan Good, uh, Yvonne Armand, DJ Armand. Okay. Uh, DJ Catrona, and uh, we have Asher Angel. And the original Captain Marvel, Zachary Levy. No words at this current time, so I'm going to jump over to Ryan at the Fun Facts Science Corner. Well, fun fact, first of all, half of that cast I did not fucking expect to see in this movie. <laughs> no one we'll, did. We'll get to that. No one we'll did. We'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to that later. Um, regarding the fun facts about this movie, um, originally this was going to be one film with both Shazam and Black Adam meeting and clashing, but the producers, namely the person who should be, who will be playing Black Adam, Dwayne the fucking Rock Johnson, uh, decided to split this film into two origin films for both characters, which was very, very smart, if I do say so myself. That might have made this movie um, a little too heavy to have him in here. I, it, it, yeah. it would have... Like, it, it would have made this movie too heavy, and it was already a little heavy, and I'll get to that later. Uh, but yeah, the decision was made to split the two origin stories, um, so we'll be on the lookout for Black Adam's movie later on, which will be really cool. But if you caught it, 
they did make a very small reference to Black mm-hmm. Adam's story, mm-hmm. which I heavily appreciated that they did it so lightly. It was, it wasn't a, hey, look, we've got a sequel coming. It was a, oh, and this guy did something. But never mind. Here's that. Not important. Da, 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 da. Not important right now. <laughs> that, that is how you do a drop for a trailer, for, for a second movie. But I digress. Take notes, Batman versus Superman. <laughs> Hey, you know what? I feel like they're learning from their mistakes. Oh, they, they are. Lie. They, they I feel are. Like they're, I feel like they got the hint, and they're like, hey, look, we can actually do it right. Um, fun fact number two, Henry Cavill was in talks to reprise his role as Superman for a cameo at the end, which would have been great, but was unable to do so due to scheduling conflicts with Mission Impossible Fallout. I don't blame him. That was a bomb ass movie. <laughs> that that movie though seems to be the Achilles heel for the DCEU right now. <laughs> well, I mean, when you look at how Man of Steel went and you look at how Dawn of Justice went, I can't blame him for taking the option to go with the known franchise that knows what the fuck it's doing and like he can actually have a good role in it. Oh, no, no. I, I, I'm not I'm not blaming him or anything, but it's just kind of funny how that movie is now twice kind of impacted yeah. his ability to do something with this. <laughs> it's like, hey, Henry Cavill took the sure bet because you guys couldn't get your acts together. But again, I digress. Uh, last but not least, in some versions of the comic, Billy Batson resides in Fawcett City, named for Fawcett Comics the company that originally created the Captain Marvel character in 1939. In those Fawcett comics, Billy resides in New York City. In the New 52 films and in this film, he lives in Philadelphia, possibly to further separate his time from when he was known as Captain Marvel and all that fucking Bri- like bramble patch of, of nonsense with uh, branding and lawsuits and all that good stuff. Yep, and if you want to see more information on that, definitely check out various uh, YouTubers and whatnot. I like to think I think we mentioned it. In, it w- we'll mention it. Sorry, in our uh, Captain Marvel episode, uh, Movie Bob does a pretty good breakdown of the whole thing. Uh, I don't have links at the moment, but definitely check them out. Look it up, Movie Bob, Captain Marvel. I'm sure there's plenty of videos you can find for that. Um, indeed, with, indeed, indeed. With that, Ryan, uh, let's get some initial thoughts out of the way. Uh, I can pop on this real quick since you just had your bit. Um, to me, I expected this to be pretty fun because uh, the trailers looked really good. And I think I came out of it with uh, my expectations either met or surpassed in some ways. Like Not like overly surpassed by any means, but definitely like I got some more surprises out of it than I expected to get. So I had a good time with this. Okay, okay. That's nice. um, my initial thoughts, um, I honestly many initial thoughts again because i forgot that it came out this week <laughs> but um um i enjoyed the film um i think it was very fun i think there were some tonal i won't say inconsistencies but there were some like changes in tone that <laughs> threw me a little bit and, you aren't wrong like, you aren't wrong i i feel i feel like the the separate parts of the movie were done very well but there were like there were times in transition where it's just like man wait what <laughs> like, so, what so the hell? and, and I, then he goes and fights and and fights for his family okay god damn sure why not so i have something i'll say about that but i have a synopsis i'm gonna get to first real quick please do here we go <clears throat> We start with Thad, a young Harry Potter wannabe who is given a glimpse of it into a world of possibility, only for it to be snapped shut in his face because he ain't special. The kid returns to his shit life only to spend years and countless millions to find a wizard who attested him and take the power by force. And to his credit, he actually does. Very impressive. Uh, and looks way better than when he had that green lantern rain on, too, I might say. Uh, Honestly, I think I think the 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 glowy eye looks better on him than the than the per, than the per, the pink skin. I think I think it's a better look. It's not a high bar to surpass. Let's be honest. <laughs> it is kind of funny that we started this whole series with Green Lantern and we're ending it with him in this and Shazam. It's actually pretty Mark fun. Strong. He refuses to die. I love God it. Damn. Uh, he also <laughs> takes the incarnations of the seven deadly sins, a la uh, uh, Full Metal Alchemist. Uh, left mm-hmm. with uh, little time and dwindling power, the wizard calls upon the young, the aid of the young Billy Batson. Let's find out who that is. Billy, an orphan, has been looking for his mom, who he lost at a carnival circus thing one day. 
Uh, been there, buddy. Still looking for mine, too. Uh, he is taken in by a foster home that is a little bit more of a Burger King's kids club, if you ask me. He and Freddy Fast Crutch uh, talk superheroes, challenge bullies, and go to school before Billy is called in by the wizard we mentioned a minute ago to take on the powers of Shazam. Which Shazam! Is an which is an acronym, which if you watch the movie, you'll get all the details. Uh, he returns home to Freddy, and they bungle their way through superhero antics, kids pretending to be adults, and learning in silly ways how to use these powers. Uh, and honestly, it's, it's 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 a lot of fun to watch. I more more so than I could actually describe it here. So go yeah. check it out. Um, and a Ghostbuster Grumman style kind of horror, Thad, we're gonna call Doc Savannah, uh, goes to his father's company and straight up murders a whole room of executives with his demons. And a scene that gave me kind of berserk esque vibes. Yeah. Uh, his next stop was Trump Tower, but the demons warned him that the wizard found a champion who could stop him if left unchecked. Savannah asks this to be taken to him. Uh, during the fallout of one of their arguments, Shazam shows off some of his uh, shows off for some people and gives the bus a little bit too much charge. He saves the people from the accident he causes, and Savannah finds him. Fighting happens, and Savannah discovers Shazam's connection to Freddy. Uh, when Billy depowers and returns home, he is scolded by his foster parents, and the siblings give him the whereabouts uh, of his mother, who he'd been looking for, because they kind of, you know, got nosy in his private life. Uh, he finds her, and only to discover that she abandoned him kind of on purpose, and doesn't really want to go back to being a mom. Man. I got some words for that. That's a, that's a, that's a powerful moment there for Boy, me. Boy, I was... <clears throat> okay, keep going, keep going. He returns to his foster home. He now calls his real family. Uh, because Savannah has taken him hostage. Uh, Shazam tries to relate to Savannah, but he isn't seeing eye to eye. Uh, uh, uh. I see what you did! <laughs> uh, the siblings help him escape, and they fight in a, carniv in a carnival circus thing. I don't think it's the same one. Uh, Shazam then realizes that he can't do this alone, and he grants his powers to all of his siblings, basically making them the Shazam-style Power Rangers. Lord have mercy. Uh, more fighting happens, and they save the day. Uh, Superman shows up in a gag from the neck down because he still isn't over his mustache problem. <laughs> Savannah <laughs> is visited by a worm who threatens us with a sequel hook. And we get another fish joke at the expense of Aquaman. Guys, okay, listen, listen. It's funny. We got our we got our laughs out, but can we get over this now? Aquaman's cool now, right? Are we still making these jokes? Hey, 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 like, like, to be fair, the movie does actually, like, play into that. He's like, what the fuck can Fish do? And he's like, um, command an army of billions and fucking take over all life in the ocean? Kid's actually wearing an Aquaman shirt? I'm just like, yeah, kid, you're right. You're absolutely <laughs> right. No, Fr Freddy is pretty, pretty on, on point there. Like, he's not the best character throughout the movie, but he's on point at that moment right there. Hands down. Ah, oh, man. So, Ryan, now that we've uh, bungled our way through that whole mess, uh, how did you think of the movie? What, what were your thoughts? Let's get let's get into this. Let's dive deep. All right. So, deep dive, deep dive. Um, I think it's real. I think it's. I think the major appeal of this movie is kids that are granted superpowers, and in and of itself is a fun concept. And when taken to the extreme, like it does in the movies, where all of his foster brothers and sisters get to be fucking Shazam mode uh, and they're like super strong but they're also kids that's a that was a lot of fun that was mm -hmm. a lot mm -hmm. of fun like and to be fair like and to be honest to be honest like I'm looking at the fight and I'm like dude seriously how the fuck is he gonna fight like six demons and Savannah like he doesn't really even know how to use his powers yet and they can phase at will like this is this is broke as shit and I didn't see it until it was happening I'm just like god damn okay fine they all get to be damn near as strong as Superman that's fine all these kids can just be boss that's cool well what's what's funny is I was watching this with my buddies and my one buddy Robbie no not Robbie uh Robert I didn't too many people named Rob um anyway uh, Rob was saying something along the lines of how when he when the movie start, first introduced his brothers and sisters, we're both like, okay, so these are going to be the Marvel family sometime, but like that's a sequel thing, right? They're not gonna they're not gonna do this now. And when they finally did at the end of the movie, we were both like, oh, they're gonna actually go full gun on this one. Shit. Okay, we're we're down for this. Let's do it. <laughs> 
Now, does is this a thing that actually happens in the comics? Because this took me entirely by surprise. Yes. Uh, so in the Damn. original in the original iterations of the comics, he had some sidekick characters like uh, Uncle Marvel, Mary Marvel, who's still a thing. Uh, various other characters like Hillbilly Marvel. It gets really silly. Um, a lot of that what? gets a lot of that gets rebooted, obviously, for uh, the New Fifty Two, and so the characters you see on screen are the New Fifty Two versions. That, okay, because I was worried. Like, the only thing that was keeping me from going full ham on these kids that are rocking stupid, like, superpowers is that, guys, Shazam is damn near on par with Superman. And we just gave, like, five other people the same powers. Well, so, so here's, the, here's the thing about Shazam that I have always loved, though. And I'm not, I, I don't read the comics that I really should, but the thing, the concept I loved about Shazam from the get go is he is the ultimate power fantasy, hands down. What? Who reads comic books? Large percentage of that artist is going to be kids, or the people who grew up with comic books. But yeah. back when this character came out, that was kids, hands down. And this character, not, not only being as powerful as Superman, but just like being able to be like, hey kids, do you want to be Superman too? Here's a kid who can do it. It's no wonder he outsold Superman back in the day, and it's no wonder he is so much fun to see now. And it's just like... Okay, this is a movie that's fucking aimed right in the square of the face of the kids, but it's yeah. also something that everyone can enjoy, and it, it, it does it really well. You're right, you're right. It, 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 like, it definitely is aimed towards children, but it's not exclusively for children. Everybody Absolutely. else who watched it was having a, bland, a grand old time, myself included. The only thing that threw me, and I won't <laughs> even say that it threw me, I won't even say, I won't say that it threw me, but it felt a little incongruent to the rest of the story was the the foster parent storyline and the and like like the real life i'm trying to find my parents storyline that's a that's a heavy ass storyline and like it like there are there are moments where you get like these really heavy ass storylines and then he says shazam and he actually gets to be a kid only in an adult's body. Like, I felt Zachary Levi got to be more of a teenager than Asher Angel did. Asher Angel had to carry, like, the heavy shit where he has to go confront his mom, who he finds out <laughs> fucking abandoned him. Like, is it, is on it purpose. Of, is it kind of interesting, though, how Zachary Levi, the adult of the, t of the pair, gets to be the more childlike, innocent, fun character, and then uh, Asher has to actually like grow up and be an adult it's almost like there's a lesson there somewhere <laughs> i just i just i felt bad <laughs> like i felt bad because you the only like real moment that you get to see child billy be a child is like the very first scene where he's where he pranks these cops to try and and even then it's done in service of his greater quest but like, like you, you see Billy Batson as a child, and every time you see him, he's either fully in, like, the loneliness that has been his life for the past, like, fucking ten years, or, like, hyper-resistant to anybody who's trying to actually care for him, or, tr or, like, devoting his life to, like, finding this person who ultimately did not want to be in his life. Like, these are heavy-ass storylines that this child has to handle. And I felt really, really bad that the only time he could actually be a child was when other people didn't see him as one. Well, and I think, so, it comes to a question I ask later on in this, and I think we can probably bring it up now because it kind of fits. Because um, I think this ties into the film's discussion of heroes and hero worship. Because I think it's also, like, ties into the like, relationship that Freddy has with Shazam slash Billy a little bit. Because, so, hear me out. So, Billy ha idolizes his mom and thinks, like, the world of her, even though she just disappeared. Like, he wants to make this relationship happen. He thinks this will solve all of his problems. Similarly, Freddy thinks that Billy and his newfound Shazam powers will be, like, this new thing that will just escalate them to new levels of popularity, fun times, good times, all that stuff, get him out of this, you know, foster world and into something more con con concrete and real. But I think that we find out in both situations that that's not what the uh, the idolized character really wants to do. Billy just wants to have fun and, at the end of the day, save people when he realizes that that's what his powers should be for. And his mom wants to 
Well, we don't really get to see what her mo his mom wants to do, but it sounds like being a mother and having this family has never been on her mind at all. And it kind of is one of those things where it's maybe a little lesson to kids that are that are, are going to be watching this saying, hey, you know, having heroes is great, but sometimes when you meet them, it's not going to always be what you want it to be. Be the hero you want to be in yourself, man. I can see that. I, I can see where you're coming from. I don't wholeheartedly agree with it. I feel like... I feel like Billy's entire like life has been wrapped up in the search for his mom. And when he gets the powers of Shazam and he becomes like pretty much an adult with superpowers, it's not kind of like a way to for to fast forward that, but it it really functions as the only escape that he's had from his whole life of trying to find this person who seemingly and actually didn't want to be found. So when he finds the powers, of course he's having a fucking blast with them and just fucking around and taking selfies and shit because it's the first time that he doesn't really have to deal with the heavy real life bullshit. He can just be a guy with superpowers that everybody loves to be around. And so, yeah, the Shazam character becomes an escape for him. And then, to, like, then in the course of the movie, he fi like he realizes that with these powers must come great responsibility. Thank you, Uncle Ben. Um, and, Those words are know, always the best. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's so it's so succinct. It's like it's like the thesis statement for every fucking superhero. With great power comes great responsibility. That's it. That's quintessentially what a hero is. Mm -hmm. But I digress. Um, so he, he he learns that lesson when the people who actually want to be with him are in danger, and he has to get his shit together and really be really be a part of a family, which is really really cool. But the the two stories feel very separate, like like they they feel separate up until like and and it, it never felt more separate. Then when he actually goes and like talks to his mom, finds out that he was just straight fucking abandoned, and then he says, "Well, I guess I gotta go save this family now." And I'm like, "What the fuck? You just went through something that requires like years of therapy. Like seriously, that one moment has like years of therapy written all the fuck over." It. And he's just like. Well, I, I have places to be. All right, let me go fight this villain. Well, if it's like, a, if it's anything damn. like me, if it's, if it's anything like me, and this is just me spitballing here, whenever I get bad news, whether it be of someone died or a breakup or whatever, uh, my reaction isn't to react right away. It's to think about it, process it, and take time to actually come to grips with what the hell that actually is. So maybe that's kind of what his process is: is he's making them taking a moment to be like, okay. I need to step I away mean, from the situation right now. I'm going to go distract myself with something, and I'll deal with this later. <laughs> and let me let, like let, let me let me be clear. Like I don't I don't think they did a bad job in portraying it in the movie. I don't. Um, and I don't. I'm not like bashing his decision to actually go help the people who really want to be a part of his family. That 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 makes perfect sense to me. But I will say, the tone of the two scenes the transition between those two scenes it doesn't smoothly connect because he just got a fucking bomb dropped on him and he recovered from it pretty well to go save his family whereas like i can only tell you like if i went through some shit like that i would be done i would just be gone for a good minute and i i, I would really want to go save people but shit man he got hit with something big like i i honestly was not expecting the movie to go there with the story like even even though when you're hearing the story at the beginning and you're like he gets lost at a carnival and he does the thing that the kids are supposed to do he goes to the police and the police are trying to find his parents and i'm like seriously his mom couldn't fucking find him he was right there with the cops and they have like a bullhorn and everything and when it comes out, she's like, no, I saw you. I just was like, nah, I'm peaced out. And I'm like, wow. 
Fuck you. Oh, I was eating on that mom super hard. I was, I was, it, 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 it just kind of took me out of the movie, honestly. It just kind of took me out of it. And, and that's fair, that's fair. I definitely think it's something that, because he literally, he literally walks away from the movie to go do that. So it, it's, it's definitely a scene that doesn't quite fit. I don't think it's bad, but I do think that it's something that needed to be built up fit. to more. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it doesn't fit. Like, it was a good scene. And, like, it made sense for his character, but that was, that's a heavy-ass thing to drop. And, like, it's, it would be hard to navigate coming back, coming into and coming out of a scene like that. And so, yeah, I think it kind of fell short in the transition. That's, that's like, my only, like, real gripe. Right. I feel like it's something that would have been more impactful in a sequel, but then I feel like there's really no way for him to connect with the other siblings then, because that's kind of how yeah. he connects with them so i don't know it, it's a st- tough situation i don't know how you rewrite out you rewrite out of it it is but i think they did yeah. the best they could of what they had i i do believe so too they even foreshadowed it when he's having the conversation um towards the beginning with the with the principal and saying hey you're spending all this time looking for someone who if we're gonna be honest has not spent a lot of time looking for you so why don't you go with these people who want to be with you? Like, it's literally, like, the, the choice was literally put at the beginning, but he wasn't able to see it yet. And then he was only able to really connect with that after he straight heard it from his mom that she didn't want to be his fucking mom. Now is not a really good time for me. I almost wanted to slap the shit out of her. Oh, my God. Oh, man. I mean, I, I see was... where you're coming from on that one. I do. I would, like... I, 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 that parenting is a trigger for me, man. It's a button, and I was mad at the end of that conversation. So yeah, I feel I feel like the only issue I have is I wish he'd gone through the proper channels for putting him up for adoption rather than abandon him, because I understand parenting can be a burden and it can be an overwhelming experience for anyone who is literally not mentally prepared for it. So, but she don't just fucking drop, like the, just fucking leave. The oh no, 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 no. I, 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 I agree with you. I agree with you. I, yeah. like I said, I wish she'd gone through proper channels. Um, but I do sympathize with her to an extent, not completely, but to enough of an extent where I can at least see why she did it. I just disagree yeah. with the methods completely. The, the the movie does a really good job of painting her story. It really does. Yep. You know, like you like like she's like I was seventeen, and like she just had no idea what the fuck she was doing, and the, the the father just decided to fucking dip, and she had no clue what the hell she was doing. Her parents abandoned her. She didn't know, and all of the scenes that were all like shiny and bright that you saw from his perspective, you saw from her perspective and they were all dark and gloomy. And that was really well done. Fuck. That was really well done. That was very, very well done. So I, I think they portrayed it really, really well. And I think her decision is understandable. It still pissed me off. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. Um, so I guess, I guess let's, let's lean into that real quick. So Ryan, obviously with the mom and with, well, Actually, there's one more thing I want to hit before I get to that real quick. Um, so there's there's a couple different themes and messages this movie tries to hit at. So we talked about, you know, a, a, the obsession and hero worship we just mentioned there a little bit. There's another one I want to mention I think is worth talking about. And that is that this film really takes the concept of the chosen one and throws it out the goddamn window. <laughs> Doesn't it? Doesn't it? It's fucking fantastic. So let me, let me frame it up for those listening. So you have Thad. You have Savannah, who... Uh, is like, oh, you could be the chosen one. Oh, wait, no, 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 no. You, 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 you aren't the chosen one. Psych, get out of here. And he forces this destiny upon himself to make it happen. And then, out of pure desperation, he's not a chosen one. He's just the last guy that the wizard could pull from the hat. And like, okay, listen, kid, I've got like 30 seconds left, so say my name, take the powers, and please do something to stop that guy, because I'm fucked. <laughs> <laughs> And like, like I love that idea. A fucking it's fucking kid. It's dude. so good. What? It's so good. <laughs> yeah, like I I I love that the movie decided to like do away with the with the the whole Oh, well Billy Batson was obviously chosen because despite his troubled past, he has he has a pure heart and you know, the heart of a child is uncorruptible. Da, 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 da. No. <laughs> it's like We've been calling, like, all these adults. Nobody's passed the goddamn test. And literally, this dude just escaped with the power of the seven deadly sins 
and I have no further options. This kid is 15. Fuck it. Just take the car, please. <laughs> Just go. Do the thing, please. The uh. spell wouldn't have pulled you if there wasn't something in you, but I'm dying. And the people that ran the test have dipped. So just fucking do it. <laughs> I'm like, okay. All right, that's why. Um, and, I, and I like that, though. It's really well done. Because, I mean, you have your Star Wars, you have your Harry Potter, you have all these other franchises out there that have this whole, you know, destined chosen one thing. And I don't know about you, Ryan, but it's a little bit tiring to hear that same kind of rhetoric used over and over again. So I mean... it's very refreshing when they bring it up a little bit. But then they're like, just throw it out the window, like, nope, chosen one, nah, we're gonna, we're, we're just gonna make this happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, it's kind of like a uh, bread and butter of like typical fantasy things, and of course, the, um, this has heavy fucking fantasy and uh, and uh, mytho- mythological elements to it. So yeah, you like, you can expect to see like, oh well, there's this grand wizard who once stood on the council of wizards who is looking for the chosen one to absorb his power and become the champion. And da 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 da. da. But what I love, what I really really loved uh, with what they just how they decided to subvert this uh, subvert this trope is that they also show the flip side of that. They say, what if you're you're clued into the fact that all of this fantastical shit exists and then you're told you're not good enough that is the best way to handle it too i was like oh shit okay (laughs) and that kid becomes the villain because his whole fucking life he was told you're not good enough and then a fucking wizard pulls him out of the ether just to tell him, nah, you know what, you're not good enough. And it fucking drove him crazy. Of course it did. But I so, mean, yeah. that's not uncommon, though, if you think about it. Like, just thinking about it real quick, uh, Anakin was told he was the chosen one. And look what happened to him. Look, uh, he, he wasn't good enough. And Luke ended up being the real chosen one after all. Maybe. It's still in the air. Who knows? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah it, he's pretty much the chosen one. Right? <laughs> But if saying, you had read the extended universe, you would fucking know that Luke Skywalker is... Never mind, I'm sorry. They're, <laughs> they're, they're no longer canon. They don't... I, I read all those books for nothing, apparently. It's fine. <laughs> but no, like, it, it's not an uncommon practice where the one who is thought to be the chosen one or the one who is, like, denied the, 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 the final, like, end goal because he's not... He or she's not good enough. It's not uncommon that they become the villain, but it's just never been paid in such a stark contrast like this before like it's never been yeah. this like in your face the main the, the main conceit of the film before and it's just done to, to, to the best of its abilities here it is done very very well i love the way they handled that um i love that they use this movie to subvert such a commonly used trope so i'm i'm really excited for what they do with black adam because like so so my read on it my read on it and I, I I looked it up on Wikipedia and was confirmed uh, but um, they he he referenced that they had chosen a champion in the past but he used his powers for revenge and in doing so actually released the seven deadly sins and that's why they're in this predicament today and that's also why they've gone for centuries without choosing a champion because the last thing they last time they did it became a huge issue Mm -hmm. black adam is the original champion so i'm very very excited to see especially how they handled those tropes in this movie i'm very excited to see a black adam origin story that in and of itself has to be a little more serious in tone. I'm very excited to see what they do with that. So um, if, and how they and how they bring it into it. So if I'm correct, and I might be off by a little bit, but for, if I remember correctly, Black Adam's powers are stuff he worked towards. Like he didn't just get chosen like Billy did, but he actually like worked himself up to get that right to earn the powers. Whereas Billy was just kind of handed them at last minute, basically. So I'm also right. kind of curious to see how that plays into their dynamic, too. Because I'm pretty sure there's going to be something along the lines of, you aren't really worthy of this, you were just handed this shit, I actually had to work for this shit, and that'll be an interesting dynamic to see them explore. Yeah, I mean, it'll, I mean, I mean, Savannah started hinting on it, he's like, you know, they told me that I wasn't worthy, and here you come with all these powers, what the fuck makes you so special? And then over the course of their, like, battling, he's just like, you're just a fucking kid! 
you don't deserve this shit, so give me the power. I've, like, devoted my whole life to doing this shit. Give me the power that you were just handed. And so we'll, like, well, it'll be, it'll be a very interesting, it'll be very interesting to see how they handle Black Adam and how the more serious tone of Black Adam's origin will mesh, will mesh with kids get superpowers movie. I'm very interested to see how that plays out. I mean, this movie played the whole demon monsters with kids angle pretty well, so I think it's doable. I think they could pull it off. I think it's doable. It'll just be really interesting to see how they do it because because that like they've already proven that they're able to subvert tropes and like take what you're expecting to see and be like, nah, actually, here's something different. So I'm 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 interested. I'm I'm excited, interested actually to see it because the more I think about it, the more I realize how much they subverted tropes. I'm actually very interested in this franchise and to see where it goes. Absolutely. Uh, speaking of uh, subversions and references and whatnot, there's a lot of references in here, from other comics to video games to other movies, in fact. Ryan, what is your favorite joke and or reference that you managed to catch in this one? <sighs> I have one. I, I want to spit it out right now real quick. Go ahead, go ahead. So there's a scene in the movie where they're all in this, like, ca- they're, they're, they're in the magic cave. And uh, they knock Savannah down, and the kids and Shazam run away. And they get to this room full of doors. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, this is going to be cute. They're going to go through doors like Scooby-Doo or some bullshit. Or maybe it'll be like Monster Zinc, and they'll be like different dimensions and shit. So they are different dimensions. They're, they're doors to different, different worlds. Um, the first one they open is to a room full of crocodile men, which is kind of cool. <laughs> so that was pretty hilarious, yeah. The, the one that got me, though, was the very next one they show, where the, where the uh, Hispanic kid, I can't remember his name, uh... Fuck. I don't remember. Uh, he opens the door. And it's a bunch of mist and fog. And you're like, okay, that's a little spooky. And out comes this little tentacle thing. And at first I'm like, I recognize that, but I don't remember from where. And then they, you know, they fight it off, they close the door, and they realize they have to go somewhere else. I thought about it for a hot 30 seconds, and then I turned to a man and I'm like, that's the tentacle from the fucking mist movie. <laughs> Wow, really? Yep, I looked it up. I looked it up yesterday to confirm it is the tentacle from Stephen King's Mist movie. Oh wow, that's a deep cut. Oh, I really like that. Oh, I, I really, I have to see the Mist. I really do. Well, I have it on my short list for potential stuff we'll do for Halloween, so that might be a doable. Oh boy, one. that might be a doable. Oh boy. <laughs> but yeah, to, to get to get that reference in a Shazam movie was not expected. So bravo to you guys in that one. Bravo. So my favorite joke um, slash reference, it actually isn't a reference to, to anything to anything specific. I just, I liked, I, as a broad aside, I like the subtlety that this movie shows. It has a lot of like in your face things and really funny things, but it actually seeks to further hide the subtle shit. And when you catch the subtle shit, it's actually, it, 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 you get more out of it because it was so subtly done. Um, and uh, one of the most subtle things that I caught um, was like pretty much in the very next scene when she's like, all right, Billy, apparently you have the power to fucking teleport us out of here. So teleport us to the first place you see. And they end up teleporting <laughs> to the fucking strip joint. <laughs> and the 18 year old girl's like, really, really? This is the first place that you thought of. And the little girl was like, why are my eyes covered? And the Hispanic kid who just comes out is just like, it's not really my thing. And I was like, oh my God, that's perfect. It was it was so subtly stated, just a brief hint to the fact that this kid might be gay or might be asexual. And it wasn't made a huge thing of. It wasn't blown out of proportion. It wasn't like really made like a big punchline. It was just dropped, and then they kept going. It was so well done. That's that's what representation can be, honestly. And at the end of the movie, he's a fucking bomb ass superhero with a crazy beard and big ass guns. He, man, it's so cool. It's, it was just so cool. I really liked that moment. That, that was that was pretty strong. That was pretty strong. I want to follow it up by the whole like uh, with the little girl being like all happy that the one uh, Freddy was covered in glitter. <laughs> <laughs> That was pretty good, too. That um, was really good. Okay, so moving on from that, favorite superpower test. 
I know what mine is, Ryan. What's yours? What's your favorite superpower test? My favorite superpower test had to be uh, the teleportation test. Oh, yes. He got into a box. <laughs> and then he scratched out the, 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 the placard and said, fire immunity test. We're going to see what's happening. <laughs> And uh, he out of the box, he's like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, we just had to see, he's like, I'm gonna beat your ass. It was, uh, uh, yeah, that was my favorite. I don't think, I don't think I could have picked anything better, that is such a good one. <laughs> my, my, my second favorite, though, has to be, it has to be the singer at the end, where he's talking to the fish, and he says, oh, are you lonely? Oh, well, that's okay, buddy, because there's plenty of fish in the sea. Come on, I can't fucking talk to fish, what are you talking about? <laughs> Just because of the pun. That's Just good. because of the pun. That's good. That's good. Um, okay, so let's see. We have time for a couple more. Well, one more here, probably. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see what we got here. Okay, so post credit scene. So we already talked about the, the fish one. So the other one, where Doctor Savannah's in the prison cell and he's like scribbling shit all on the walls, and he gets talked by some disembodied voice, or so we think. And as the camera pans into where he's looking and where he's finding the voice coming from. He sees, from the very beginning of the movie, the little worm creature that was, like, in a jar in the magic cave. A fucking caterpillar. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mr. Mind, I believe, is what he's called in the comics. Ryan, mm -hmm. that is a sequel setup. That's a fucking sequel setup right there. What do you make of that? That is what, what do you think? a sequel setup. I loved it. I honestly loved it because this is... Like, when I mentioned earlier that this movie does subtle shit really, really well, this is one of the, thing, the subtle things that they did really, really well. They had one shot of the thing in the, of the, of the caterpillar in the glass when Savannah, as a young child, shows up. Then they have one shot where Billy shows up the after, jar's broken. like, the fucking things have escaped. Jaw is broken. That's it. And you're just like... Oh, the fucking jar got broken. His fucking caterpillar escaped. Don't know. <laughs> and then, the like, you're like, hey, that wasn't the only spooky ass thing the fucking wizard kept in his vault. And there it is. He's fucking out. And this is the sequel setup. I really, really like. I really, really like it when movies manage to surprise me. And especially when, like, when you've seen so many superhero films, you can almost see where they're going to go ahead of time. Like, because I, I don't want to say it's overly formulaic, but, I mean, there have been a lot of superhero films. And while I've enjoyed the majority of them, a lot of them you can tell what's coming. This one came right out of left field. It was very, very subtle. The hints were there. Just enough to be like, yeah, guys, that was a fucking dangerous thing. And now it's out. And now he's hooking up with Savannah. And this will be very interesting. Stay tuned for Shazam 2. That's all you need. I Here's what I think. Here's what I think. I, I imagine this is how it's going to tie into the next movie. I imagine Black Adam was like uh, Billy at the beginning, where he was a good hero and he did good things. I imagine this worm, this little caterpillar is what talked him into unleashing the death, seven deadly sins, and that's why he was imprisoned with the wizard, because he knew that if he kept out there, he could have made more stuff like that happen. Ooh. Maybe. Maybe. That will be interesting to see. I mean, he's... Like, the, the caterpillar is already set up to be, like, you know, the fucking devil on your shoulder that empowers, like, horrible, horrible shit to happen. Mm -hmm. So... At like, and he's, he's hooking up with Savannah, who apparently is just, like, the most convincible person on the fucking planet. He's just like, I want magic! I want to be special! I want it all, like, and I want it yeah, now. Yeah, bro, but, but stop. Just fucking stop it. So, yeah, I, like, that, like, with the subtlety of how they did that, how they laid that track there, and, uh, and the surprise at the end, I'm like, you know what? This is really, really interesting. It got me... It got me excited. It drummed up some. Uh, it drummed up some buzz for uh, for Shazam too, which is like far off in the distance. Mm -hmm. So kudos to them. That's how. That's how you do a fucking setup for a sequel. And one last one because I missed this one completely. Uh, so Ryan, this movie seems to celebrate superhero families, and uh, that goes against the usual trend of superhero films, kind of wanting to get rid of those sidekicks. You know, locking uh, locking Robin in the closet and whatnot, getting them out of here. They're not good enough. 
Do you like how they did the whole superhero family thing? Do you want to see more sidekicks and spin-off heroes make it make it to the big screen alongside their 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 main hero counterparts? Uh so I like I like how they did it in this in this one. Um I think like I, again, I was worried with the fact that they've just added like five other people of Superman's like fucking might to the to the DC lore. But like if they exist solely in Shazam's like universe, like Shazam has to go off and fucking help people in the goddamn uh, like help the guys in the justice league so the other five will have to hold down philadelphia that's fine that's perfectly fine i'm 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 perfectly okay with that um i think the danger comes especially when you're doing like a big when you're doing like a big multi-movie uh comic book like universe adding a bunch of like sidekicks and side characters it, it gets confusing when you have to bring them all together. I mean, look t- look at Marvel, for instance. Like, um, Iron Man brought War Machine. Um, fucking Captain America brought uh, Winter Soldier. And Falcon. You know, a- and Falcon. You know, like, it, like when people start bringing, like, people, like, from, from their perspective franchises start bringing their sidekicks to, like, the main stage, that's when I think things can get a little confusing. And when we just added five of Superman's strength, I was a little worried. But I think they did it well here. I kind of want to see more like this. Not necessarily like make everyone Shazam. That's that's silly. But like, I would like to see Robin finally get back into the Batman films. I know people are not very hip hip to the idea, but Bat- Robin's been part of the Batman mythos since like the first year of his publication. Like, it was maybe like a few a few months to a year of Batman being solo. And then Robin was there, and he's yeah. been consistent to the mythos since. And it's like, how do we not have Robin back in films yet? Like, I get that uh, Schumacher kind of stained the well with that one, or poisoned the well with that one, but certainly there's got to be someone out there who can do it right, right? Someone, <laughs> anyone. I believe so. Um, I think if, uh, like, and I don't know what the fuck is happening with the Batman property right now. Like, in all honesty, especially with uh, Ben Affleck backing out, if they decided to just not do Batman films for, like, five years, I would be perfectly okay with it. Give some people some t- give people some time to breathe and then try and do it again. Uh, and then you can get into, like, stuff like the Bat family. Then you can get into fucking uh, Dick Grayson being Robin, growing up in Batman's tutelage and then becoming Nightwing. Then you can get more of the Batman, of the, of the Robins, like Tim Drake. Then you can finally get fucking Jason Todd and the Red Hood on the big screen. I honestly want to see Under the Red Hood as a fucking feature film, because that is one of, if not my favorite Batman story. Mm-hmm. And hopefully so, we'll be able to cover that one yeah. these days. Hopefully, hopefully. I mean, shit. Like, like, like we 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 drum up like the mythos and the fucking the the fucking power of Batman. And when you start introducing the fact that he's been bringing people up in his footsteps, and then you're like, well, what happens when one of those kids who is like a really really talented protege <laughs> goes nuts, and now you have an evil Batman who uses guns, who's damn near as good as Batman. What do you fucking do? Like, that, that's that's a really cool thing, concept to explore. And I want to see it in real life. I want to see it IRL. By the way, did you see the news over these past couple weeks where uh, Zack Snyder came out and said, oh yeah, Batman kills people and fuck you if you don't think so. I laughed. I'm like, man, question for you, Snyder. If Batman is willing to kill criminals, why is Joker still alive? That's 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 for real, for real, guys. Like it's been it's been it's been confirmed time and time again that Batman has had several instances where he could kill Joker, but he's like, dude, if I do that I'm no I'm no better than him. I have to I like we have to put him away. We have to put him in prison. I can't just haul off and fucking kill him. And that's what if I'm I saying. do that, it'll be too easy for me to kill everybody else that I don't like. Come on, guys! Like it's 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 such it's such a pivotal part of his character now. 
that just to say it's not a thing and it's stupid, like, you're just missing the big core part of his character. It's, it's, it's like, his parents were killed by guns. He doesn't like guns. This is really simple logic to follow. And it's actually one of the big things that makes the Batman and Flashpoint so fucking jarring because you come from normal DC where Batman refuses to use a fucking gun and then in Flashpoint, his father is just pulling out guns left and right, just shooting people down. And you're just like, that's not Batman. Who the fuck is that? Hashtag not my Batman. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, when you have Bruce Wayne running around with fucking machine guns on his Batmobile and pew, just pew. gunning people down for the fuck of it, I'm just like, guys, what are you doing? All right. Uh, well, we're, we went on a little long with this with the conversation, but I think this was definitely a good movie to have a conversation with. And surprise, surprise, we went into a Batman conversation at the end. So, oh well, <laughs> it happens. Um, I just want to I just want to touch on um, one last thing. Yeah, um, go, ahead, uh, go ahead. Getting actually back to, to to Shazam, though, I really like the emphasis that they put on foster families in this movie. Um, yeah. Like the, the, the bumper sticker on the back of the van, like as they're like running off to go like figure out where the fuck their kids are, read, I'm a foster mom, what's your superpower? And I was like, that's just fucking, that's so great. And like this whole movie is just a testament to the wonders of adoption, the wonders of being foster foster parents and like growing up in a family, like, like where it's made of people who, like their original families didn't want them or couldn't take them. And so they found people that genuinely wanted to love them and to be loved by them. And they formed their own fucking family. And it was such a wholesome, it was such a wholesome message. And the fact that all of these foster kids get superpowers at the end was just fucking boss. I was expecting at least two of them to know that Billy was was Shazam at the end of it. But all of them becoming the fucking Shazam family was surprising and wonderful. So yeah, I, 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 don't, think, I don't think very many people guessed did. that was going to happen, so... I was just like, Megan Good? In my superhero movie? What? <laughs> that was amazing. And, and you know yeah, what else no, is amazing? Kudos, kudos on for that. And you know what else is amazing, Ryan? Uh, we have a we have a bunch of ways you can contact us <laughs> on Tumblr, Twitter, and Facebook. You can also go to our email and email us directly to tell us what you took away from this film, what you liked about it, and your favorite thoughts on the foster system. Hopefully they're positive, because if not, that's very depressing. Ryan, what is that email? That email is caterpillarvoicebox at gmail. Oh, <clears throat> excuse me. That email is evacstation at gmail.com. Indeed. You know, I was actually thinking Alice in Wonderland reference for the Caterpillar when we first saw it, and then when it actually was a character, I'm like, oh, shit, that actually is a character. Okay, uh, <laughs> fuck. So, yeah, good stuff, good stuff. So, Ryan, normally this is where we compare it to, to another film, but we don't have an animated film to compare it to. I mean, Robbie said we kind of do, but, I mean, we, we, we our, our time was very limited, I think. And, uh, um, anyway. yeah. So, uh, we're going to do a quick round of ranking it, and then I have a few follow-up questions here. We're going to lightning lightning round these things real quick. Ryan, All right. on our go on our platinum to shit scale, where would you rank this film? Uh, you know what? After after the conversation, um, and uh, just the appreciation of like real good things that they did, I would give it a strong silver. Um, I think there was a lot of really good stuff to it. Um. Um, I think it was a lot of fun. I think the only thing that was holding it back was the incongruency of tone. Um, and again, like you mentioned, it was, like, it, it was essential to the plot, but at the same time, it was just a hard thing to navigate regardless. Like, I'm not mad that it was in the movie. Like, it definitely needed to be there and was well done. But the, the radical shift in tone kept it back a little bit for me still i'd give it a strong silver mm -hmm. um considering everything we've gotten from the dceu so far i feel like i might be a little too generous ryan i'm gonna give it a low gold high silver i'm like right on that borderline there 
right in that borderline. Wow. Okay. I don't think it's as deep as Wonder Woman, but it's definitely more fun than most of the armor of DC films put put out there, without question. And it's probably the second deepest of what we've gotten so far that actually so you know, la- sticks to landing. I think. So, you know, I, I'm seeing this last question and one of the questions that we didn't get to, and I feel like your comment just ha- like begs me to ask it before we go on to the lightning <laughs> round. Is DC finally back? Or do you think they've just gotten lucky for the past three movies? What do you well, think? okay, so to be fair, Justice League was sandwiched in between uh, Wonder Woman and Aquaman. So, not the last three, but I, I get where you're coming from. I get where you're coming from. Um, I think time will tell. We have Joker later this year, which we don't know what that's really going to be, but the trailers give it an optimistic look to it. Um, and then we have Wonder Woman 84 next year, which I can't imagine Patty Jenkins will screw that up. I cannot imagine she would. Um... So I'm thinking DC isn't fully back, but I do think that they're on the upswing. I think they're finally, like, realizing the mistakes, and they're finally figuring out what they need to do. So I think... I can agree with that. I think... No, please, go ahead. I was going to say, I think in the next film or two, we're going to tell for sure, but I think right now it's a little too early to tell. But I think they're definitely on the upswing. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I am right now. I think the the last couple of pro- the last couple of independent properties, um, uh, just I'm sorry, not just to sleep, Jesus Christ, um, Wonder Woman, Aquaman, and Shazam. I think they've been helmed by people who have seen the failings of the movies prior to it, and they've definitely taken steps to correct it. So I really, really like that. While they're also like looking to. They're also looking to establish their own uh, identity um, okay. on a movie, like kind of like from a from a cinematic standpoint, which is really really good. I think the next movie will really sell it. Like if the next if the next movie that comes out is just like really a, a knock out of the park, then I'm like, all right, I think they finally figured it out, guys. I think I think we have a real I think we have a real contender on our hands. But like 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 you said, time will tell. Time will tell. Indeed, indeed. Uh, okay, so I have four quick questions and then a hype train for next week's episode. So, first, Ryan, what is the best live-action film we've seen in this season so far? Ooh, shit. Um, okay, best live-action lightning round. Uh, I'm going to go with Wonder Woman. I want to agree so hard, but I think the third act of Shazam really does kind of stick landing for the film better. I think every you like Shazam more than Wonder Woman. I think every act of Shazam works really well, whereas whereas Wonder Woman, I think the first two acts are fucking great, and that third act stumbles just enough where I'm like, okay, it's a toss up here. It's really close. I could go either way, but I think I'm thinking I'm gonna give it to Shazam just because I want to be different. <laughs> I want to be different. Again, oh, that's, that's fair. Hey, that's fair. Okay. All right. I'm with you. All right. All right. So so best animated of what we've seen this season. I know my uh, answer already. That, this is an easy uh, one for me. Easy one for me. Oh, yeah. World's Finest. Yeah. World's Finest. Finest. Hands down. Hands down. <laughs> uh, if anyone says anything different, I disagree with you, but I respect you. But you're wrong. <laughs> uh, okay. So best overall, Ryan, what do you say on this one? Um, god damn. Um, so it's, uh, fuck. it's kind of, it's kind of a toss up for me between Wonder Woman and Aquaman. And it's because they hit two different buttons. Like, I think Wonder Woman is just a great piece of cinema with an amazing message and just like well done all around the board. But I feel like Aquaman is like the best summer blockbuster to ever come out in fucking December. (laughs) So sure. (laughs) I'm kind of stuck between the two. Um, Okay. And like, uh, okay. Honestly, if I'm, if we're going off of sheer enjoyment value, and just, like, in the theater had me gasping and, like, going nuts. I'm going to have to give it to Aquaman. I'm just going to have to give it that to That is him. surprising, but I respect that. Um, I'm going to fucking trip over the nostalgia goggles, and I'm going to still go with Batman Superman World's Finest. World's Finest! <laughs> it brings all of the best parts of those cartoons together. It shows how these two characters should meet properly. It is the absolute best thing you can show the Warner Brothers executives and say, hey... Hey, you know how you fucked up? This is how you could have avoided it. L- watch this blueprint right here. It's fucking great. 
That's real. That's quite real. That is quite real. Um, what are you looking forward to most next, Ryan? Um, out of DC, um, I am interested in Joker. Um, yeah. I, 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 I wasn't until I saw the trailer. And I still don't really feel great about giving the Joker a quantified origin story, but the overall tone and the depressive fucking insanity that Joaquin Phoenix is going to go through with this shit, I am very interested to see what he does with the role. So, so yeah, I, I'd say I'm more, most interested in that. Same here. I don't have enough information on Wonder Woman 84 to really say anything, so I'm going to go with Joker as well. Um, if they can make his... If they can make the narrator of, this, of the film, or I guess in this case, the point of view character, Joker himself, be an unreliable like source of information for the film and make this really weird and zany and hard to follow in terms of what actually happened to make him Joker, I'd be down for that because that's kind of what it... I, that's how I feel it's always been. And I think it should stay that way, honestly. Um, yeah, yeah. Tr- trying to nail down any specific one thing, it just seems like a very bad idea. I I actually had this conversation with Allegra because she was unaware of the origin of Joker, and I was like, "Yeah, but that's because Joker doesn't have an origin. Joker is chaos incarnate, and to say that these concrete events happened to this one person that led him to this person." It kind of, it diminishes that honestly. Like like you want to have him shrouded in mystery. He is just an agent of chaos that just shows up and fucks things up. And even if he were to tell you his backstory, you could never trust it. It would just be a fucking lie, probably. To, so to quote like, Joker yeah. himself, if I had to have a backstory, I would choose multiple choice. <laughs> yes, that, that that that's exactly what I told her. And and I like we're we're gonna have to. I'm gonna have to watch. Uh, I'm gonna. Oh fuck! Uh, I'm gonna have to watch the Killing Joke with her because she hasn't seen it. Mm-hmm. I already told her it's rough. Fast. It's fucking fast rough. forward the first part with Barbara Gordon and just watch the rest of the stuff. It's actually good. that's just weird. But no, I got. I gotta. I gotta show her the whole thing. She, uh, she has to know all the weirdness. I would say for sure though. Tell her. Okay, so this is where the comic actually starts. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right, so to hype everything up for next week, everybody, next week we are going to be talking Ant-Man, followed by Captain Marvel, and then we have a double episode that week, hopefully afterward, with Endgame and a little bit of a realignment of our rankings slash re-rankings slash discussion bit just to hype up Endgame. Um, Guys, I'm not I'm not ready for Endgame. I'm not. Like, you and I are going to be crying in the theater together because it, I'm not going to be prepared. It depends on what they do, but I would not be surprised if we were. Um, I am excited... Endgame is here, man. Endgame is coming, and y'all are gonna have some fun times listening to us talk about it. We're gonna have we're gonna have two guests on that episode. It's gonna be great. I can't wait. I can't wait to hear them all them all voices again. Yep. And then after Endgame, we'll be jumping into the Godzilla month, followed by a good summer of X Men. So stay tuned for some fun stuff here in the next few weeks. Indeed, indeed. Well, shall we shall we close it out, sir? And uh... Yep, and the only way we know how. Thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll see you after the credits. Bye!